Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. So my name is Bartosz Górski and my name is Szymon Krasowski. And together we want to tell you more about the 5G roles and how you can uh, manage your ser service life cycle uh, by using Kubernetes and CNI plugins. So without further ado, uh, let's start. So today, during our presentation today, I will first give you some um, brief overview about the current uh, 5G deployments and rollouts and what are the models that are used right now and what is the target model that we want to reach and how you can leverage the cloud native functions to have really 5G core network uh, with the full uh, performance it can provide. And after this brief uh, overview, we'll move more to the technical side and how you can integrate the containers platform into your infrastructure and how to use CNI for that. We'll also show you an example of the tanks and fabric uh, and how this integration works there. Then we'll move to a more uh, complex use case as using uh, different SDNs by leveraging Maltus. And then we also will show you a few use cases, uh, how you can use Kubernetes and CNIs to have different integrations. And after these use cases, we'll move to the Q&A session. Um, also, if you want to ask any questions during the presentation, there will be a link to Slido in the YouTube comment section. So you can post your question there and we'll answer it at the end of the presentation. So maybe to start, um, so recently there was quite a lot of uh, rum rumors and also the news about the 5G networks and uh, the benefits that this uh, fifth generation of the wireless networks will provide to the end users. Um, it will improve the latency, bandwidth and also the capacity of how many devices the network will be able to handle. But when it comes to 5G, it's also important to know that there are different levels of the um, band, band, with, band uh, that are used for that. There is low band, mid band, and ultra band, and high speed band. And this, uh, the full uh, benefits of the 5G network will be available to us with this uh, higher frequency. Currently, um, those benefits will also um, add the new um, capabilities to the different uh, industries with mobile and networks and smartphones to able to connect the wearable devices, self-driving cars and also more capabilities for the industry 4.0 also with smart cities and others but it's important to uh, remember that the 5G is not only the radio part but also the core network behind it and recently we saw uh, commercial rollouts of um, 5G uh, offerings in, within the different providers and you probably were able to see the 5G icon on your phone but this, is it really the ultra high band uh, network that was promised to us? To, to tell about more uh, about the current deployment models for the, for the 5G uh, networks is that right now the most of the wireless connectivity and the infrastructure was added to the existing infrastructure that we have for the 4G and the new standard for wireless communication which is called 5G NR which stands for the new radio is still leveraging the core network that was used for the previous generation of the of the networks which is called EPC uh, which stand for extended uh, packet core and, to, and it's not allowing us to benefit from all of the benefits that 5G can give us. It still um, might be similar to the performance uh, in the uh, different connectivity zones uh, with a similar performance of the 4G. And this is what we call not standalone deployment. So just <clears throat> separate the radio and access network and still leveraging the core from the previous infrastructure. To be able to uh, open and leverage the full capacity of the 5G can give us, that we will need also the new core network that will use the 
um, recent innovation within the networking industry to be able to provide the, the high-speed uh, net networking. And also the 5G will not uh, cover everything. Um, with the new benefits and the uh, lower frequency, we will uh, have the trade-off between the high speed and the, also the coverage. So we will still use the 5, 4G for the more wide area areas to be able to connect uh, to the network. So still we'll need to have the support both for the 4G and also uh, for the 5G in more dense, dense areas uh, like uh, big cities on stadiums. So still we'll need a dual mode to be able to support both of them. So what will be really needed to, to have this 5G core? Um, to, to, what are the challenges that we will need to have this 5G core? So the first thing will be the, um, the virtualization part of the different services and lifecycle management of the services. We'll move more of the um, functionalities and network function to the, to the software. And we will need to be able to manage the deployment, monitoring, and also uh, termination of the services. And this will be a challenge to be able to, to do it. And um, with the more spread it uh, and the bigger networks, we'll also need a end-to-end -end automation and make sure that we can orchestrate uh, everything from the one place and uh, improve the security by the central policy management. Also with the, a lot of different technologies and uh, smaller parts to make sure that we can keep up with the technology growth. We will need also the um, standards for different components to make sure that the more companies and more, more, more vendors, not only the large one, but also the smaller one, will be able to contribute to this um, technology. And as it uh, comes with all of the ongoing services, together with the changing of the core network, we'll need to provide a service continuity so the migration part will be also needed to make sure that we can support both infrastructures at the same time. So to be able to really provide a 5G core network that will be based on the cloud technologies, we'll need a small shift in the way how we will provide the different services. Right now from, we will move out um, we'll move away from like the monolithic architecture more to the like the service-based uh, functions to make sure that uh, we can have it smaller pieces that will be um, managed easier and will improve the time we need to deploy the different services. We will also use the recent uh, technologies in SDN to like split the brain from the muscles to make sure that we can manage from the central place the hardware that will be doing the heavy duty tasks. And also the previous uh, network was mostly based on the uh, virtualized network functions using the VMs, but we really want to have the really slow delay in the network. Uh, we will need a faster way to bring up services and this is where the containerization will take a huge part to make sure that instead of VNFs we can use the CNFs and we will need to integrate different container containerization platforms uh, within our networks. And then with all of those new technologies and the virtualization part uh, and the central part to manage all of those networks, we'll also need a way to better operate the networks and spot any problems or defects sooner and as far as possible fix them uh, in the automatic way. This is where the AIOps will help us to analyze the data that we will have and maybe propose the solutions or maybe even uh, execute those solutions automatically. Maybe even predict some of the failures before they will happen to make sure that we can match different SLAs. And to su sum up, so the, like the benefits from like the more the business perspective, the cloud native will give us a more flexibility when it comes to delivering, uh, de delivering services. We won't be based uh, or uh, dependent to the, hard, to the underlying hardware. With, um, you, with providing more standards and moving more of the intelligence to the software, we'll be able to use the white boxes. 
um, and deliver the services uh, in more f flexible way. Um, it will also improve the speed, but we are not talking here about the speed or the performance of the whole network because this will be done by the offloading some of the heavy duty tasks to the, like the programmable hardware or the smart mix. But here we are talking more about the upgrades of the network, the development of the services, uh, introducing the DevOps approach to be able to um, introduce CI and CD and do a smaller updates. Um, and microservices infrastructure will help us to do it uh, and avoid the risk of uh, doing a big changes to the network and affecting a lot of users. Also with the more centralization part, we'll have a one way to have the visibility of the whole network and see uh, what is really going under, uh, what are the different metrics and orchestrate the whole network from the one central place and gather the metrics um, used for the um, different um, AI ops models to be able to operate in the better way. And also there is a cost part. So virtualization is promising us that we'll be able to better utilize the underlying infrastructure and save some uh, money on it. But um, so for sure one of the possible ways, but also uh, with the speed, uh, that cost saving won't be only on the utilization of the network, but also on onboarding the potential clients and improving the time to market that we will have. And from like the brief overview of the 5G and the cloud native networks benefits, right now we will move more to the like the technical part and how we can really integrate the uh, containerization platforms uh, to your infrastructure make sure that transition can happen. And I will pass the uh, voice to Shimon. Thank you. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, coming to more technical uh, side of this uh, problem. So probably you know this infrastructure from the network where you have some services, you have some bare metal servers, you have, for example, OpenStack cluster with virtual machines, and this is the, the network that you may have today. And when you have a lot of services, you may meet a problem that you want to allow some traffic between, for example, two bare metal servers, you want to deny some traffic, for example, from bare metal server to OpenStack cluster, or you want to reroute some traffic because you have a monitoring service that gathers all the logs, uh, then analyzed by your SOC uh, department. Uh, so generally you may have an engineers that configure the routers, switches, firewalls, other networking devices. The, this may be uh, as well as physical devices, as well as virtualized devices somewhere in the cloud uh, or somewhere virtualized in, uh, in OpenStack cluster, for example. But then you decide one day that you want to change the, the rules that uh, that are present in your network. You want, know, for example, to uh, allow more traffic or deny more traffic or do something else. Then you need to hire engineers that will reconfigure the routers, switches, other devices, and think about the huge infrastructure when you have a lot of physical devices, so it means a lot of work to do that. Also, when you may want, for example, to apply some rules only during the nighttime or during the daytime, uh, so in some schedules, then you have a problem because each time someone has to change that to meet the requirements of your network. So that may generate a lot of problems because even if you mess up something with configuration in one router, then the whole network is down and the rules do not work properly as, as you wanted it to work. So you may use the SDN, Software Defined Network. So software defined networking gives you a possibility to have a central point like SDN controller, which allows you to specify the rules that, okay, I want, for example, to allow the traffic or deny the traffic, and then SDN uh, does everything for you. So you don't have to configure each router manually, each switch manually and apply the configuration. You may do that just from the single point in your infrastructure, and then uh, you have the whole network configured. If you think about 
there's the controller problem that it may be uh, a single point of failure. Uh, consider that uh, it has usually a high availability mode, so there are some replicas. So uh, it's the same as with other services that uh, should work all the time, no matter what happens. Okay, and maybe looking uh, on the layers of the software needed defined networking. So you have a so-called underlay net network. So these are your routers, switches, physical devices, the infrastructure layer, and at top of that you apply the control layer of SDN. So it means that uh, your SDN is communicating with these devices via API, uh, or even if you have some fancy uh, low, uh, low, not too so well known uh, router, you may even communicate via CLI. Uh, when your SDN supports that, you may uh, configure uh, the route from the SDN. But when you're a user, you only think about endpoint one, endpoint two, and I want to allow or deny the traffic between them. So I don't think about configuring routers. So there's an application layer that allows you to specify only rules, uh, high-level rules, and then SDN uh, allows you to automatically configure routers to meet the requirements that you gave in these rules to allow deny reroute traffic. And uh, the new network created by the SDN, the one that you see uh, with the rules you specified, is called the overlay network. Okay, and when we uh, do a deep dive into the SDN architecture, usually we start with SDN application. It may be the UI, it may be a CLI, or in fact, usually uh, it's uh, driving the SDN northbound interface, so some API. So when you have an API, you may even implement it with your custom, uh, custom application, custom service that, that you want to use to, I don't know, to automate uh, all the SDNs that are on the market or control all, all the SDNs on the market or do anything that uh, suits your business. Uh, and then the high level specified rule uh, goes to SDN controller, which uh, computes what should be done in the underlying network, so in physical network, to meet the requirements gave by the user. And then by the SDN control to data plane interface, uh, it sends uh, rules or configurations that should be applied to physical devices. And SDN data path are the components that sit at top of these physical uh, devices and interact with them to apply this configuration. Uh, but then, uh, there are the new trends. Uh, cloud computing is more and more, uh, more, and more popular. Uh, also, we have Kubernetes, so we have containerized uh, applications, which are not the standard virtual machines or servers. Uh, we have Kubernetes that gives IP address and provide networking for these containers. So that's the problem that it does not work uh, as it used to be with OpenStack and bare metal servers. So, uh, taking into consideration the SDN that personally I work a lot of with, I'm also a technical team committee member of uh, Tanks and Fabric. So, Tanks and Fabric is an example of the SDN uh, which, uh, apply, which applies implements the architecture that I showed you uh, in a, a few slides ago. Uh, and in fact, when you have uh, such an SDN, it does not care whether this is the virtual machine container or Bermuda server, because it has API. And as long as API is fulfilled and the endpoint, like VM or BMS container, may communicate with this API, uh, it may control, may be controlled with the SDN. So you don't have to. Uh, only, uh, only work in the range of uh, supported devices, supported solutions, you may as well uh, fulfill the API with your custom solution. So you, you may build a third party uh, solution uh, using the SDN. And this is how it is usually with other SDNs on the market. And then how do we connect with the Kubernetes? So uh, in order to fulfill the API of the SDN, Kubernetes has something called CNI. This is the container networking interface. So this is the interface used for communication between SDN and Kubernetes. So each time you create the container or pod, uh, which is usually uh, the namespace in Kubernetes that may contain one or more containers, 
uh, you'll receive an IP address from some SDN uh, called by the CNI. Uh, and also then when you have a networking between the containers uh, in different namespaces, uh, in, in different, uh, in different uh, services, uh, the, the traffic is controlled by the SDN controller. So this is the, the, the part that controls and fulfills the API of the SDN. Uh, as far as I remember, Kubernetes uh, takes only two files to configure the SDN that you want to use. SDN may be somewhere outside uh, your infrastructure, as long as you have an IP address and uh, authentication to connect to this SDN controller, you may connect to it. You may also uh, set up SDN controller inside the Kubernetes cluster and also use it as, as, as a CNI to drive the traffic and networking in the Kubernetes cluster. Okay, and when you think about uh, such a solution, and uh, you may easily come up to an idea to use multiple Kubernetes clusters and connect each of them with uh, SDN controller to make a single infrastructure of Kubernetes clusters connected with each other and driven with the same controller. And then using that idea, you may use uh, a Google Cloud or AWS and any other cloud provider to build a pretty easy multi-cloud solution. Uh, so, using the CNI and SDN, uh, multi-cloud is just one step uh, apart from, from you. Okay, and something more fancy is Multus. Multus is uh, a tool uh, used for uh, CNIs, because usually when you think about uh, the pod, you have a single interface with a single IP address, uh, received from the SDN controller. So in our uh, example from the beginning, we may have SDN controller somewhere in external, uh, in, in our infrastructure, which is external for Kubernetes cluster. So uh, what happens when you are disconnected from the infrastructure? You may have a problem because you have only single CNI driven somewhere outside of the cluster. So all the pods lose the communication. Uh, so Multus allow you, allows you to have multiple interfaces, multiple CNIs. So for example, you may use uh, Tungsten Fabrics uh, SDN and other SDN to uh, attach two interfaces, two IP addresses to the pod. So uh, Multus will allow you to call two CNIs and then uh, in your application, your pod specify which interface you want to use for which route, which traffic. Okay, and coming to the use cases, uh, the first uh, use case would be to have a private cloud uh, with, for example, OpenStack uh, cluster, or if you want something more enterprise, the VMware cluster, which will be connected with the containerized uh, services in Kubernetes or more enterprise solution, OpenShift. So just uh, using uh, configuration from the SDN controller, you may uh, allow communication and specify all the rules between the virtual machines, virtualized uh, services and containerized services. Uh, it's as easy as, as it uh, seems. Uh, another use case would be to use a hybrid cloud. So here we have a data center again with some virtual machines, here on enterprise VMware. And you may think about the example that I showed you with uh, multi-cloud to connect uh, via SDNs to cloud-native applications. So, of course, you may use the Azure, uh, ACS, uh, GCP, GKE to connect to native Kubernetes services. Uh, but also, you may think about using uh, other cloud-native solutions. For example, Azure has uh, a pretty, uh, pretty good uh, machine learning uh, tools. So if you think about using, for example, machine, machine learning in, in your services, you don't have to buy uh, the new servers with uh, good GPU, because usually we use GPU for machine learning. Think about how to configure that and what, all, what if you only want to uh, run uh, once, uh, once a year uh, such a machine learning uh, process, then uh, the rest of the year your server is uh, doing nothing, in fact. Uh, so you may just uh, call the native machine learning uh, app, uh, tool application uh, in Azure. Uh, do what you need uh, this one time of the year. Uh, 
and then uh, just shut down the uh, service. Also, you may use the SQL, both on Azure, GCP, also other cloud providers provide SQL database, so to keep, uh, keep the data, and you also don't need to think about the scalability and availability of uh, your database. Uh, GCP has a pretty cool BigQuery mechanism where you may uh, sort and look for, for data in uh, your databases so you also don't need to implement something by yourself or you may uh, easily use uh, computer cloud services which are in fact uh, cloud virtual machines that allow you to do the same workload yeah, that you have in your data center. And the third uh, use case uh, is about the Multus, the nested cloud uh, called here, because we have uh, our infrastructure, as you can see, uh, with bare metal servers somewhere in the infrastructure, and also we have Kubernetes cluster. And uh, let's say that in Kubernetes we have uh, a serv service that uh, is built with uh, microservices which communicate with each other. And on bare metal server, uh, we have, for example, the SQL. And on another bare metal server, we have uh, user data. So something which we shouldn't uh, share with the rest of the network. So uh, with the global SDN controller, we, we may connect uh, Kubernetes cluster to, to, to the bare metal servers and allow the traffic only between uh, the SQL databases and uh, services in Kubernetes cluster to gather some data and compute, compute it or put some data there uh, and deny uh, communication with user data server. And uh, in Kubernetes cluster, we may assume that, okay, this is the same service built on microservices and there's nothing uh, more running there. So we may trust these uh, containers to communicate with each other. So we may uh, add another SDN controller uh, inside the Kubernetes cluster only for uh, routing the traffic between the containers in, uh, in the Kubernetes uh, cluster. So that way, when you have a traffic outside of the cluster, you use the global SDN, but when you have uh, traffic inside the Kubernetes cluster, you use the Kubernetes SDN controller. So, uh, assuming that, for example, you lose connection uh, from your Kubernetes cluster to the rest of the infrastructure, you still have a running service which communicates uh, using the SDN. Okay, and uh, these are all the use cases that we have for you today. If you have any other ideas how you, we may use that, uh, we are welcome to share that with, uh, with us uh, in comments or uh, write uh, to us uh, from our website or uh, write to our mail. Uh, and now we have a QA session on the Slido. You may ask on YouTube comments uh, and we'll uh, tell you more, more about that and answer your questions. Thanks, Sean. Okay, I think we have the first question. And the first question is about will the 5G replace the Wi-Fi? Um, I think it's quite a generic question. Um, like My first feeling would be to say that no, it will not uh, replace the Wi-Fi. I think Wi-Fi is mostly used for like the um, short distance connectivity uh, that you normally using in your home, which is like a, your private network, but you still want to have some um, your own rules and the configuration. 5G is like more the use right now for the um, public networks and the uh, wider areas. Uh, similar like the previous generation to 4G, uh, but for sure there are like the two leading standards when it comes to wireless communication, and um, with the capabilities uh, that uh, 5G will provide, so like the low latency, high bandwidth, um, maybe it will even maybe it will replace the Wi-Fi in some places. Uh, because we, we know that uh, with the lower bandwidth, uh, we'll be using the operator's networks like LTE. Uh, sometimes when we are uh, in, inside a city and uh, we want to use the internet, we are trying to connect uh, to the public Wi-Fi, which are not the most secure networks and risky. So maybe instead of um, like using Wi-Fi and like, I don't know, 
like a Starbucks or the other coffee shops and together with the 5G and the um, infrastructure within the cities or the high dense areas will really be uh, more effective to, to, to use the uh, 5G to not need to connect to the, to the, to the unknown Wi-Fi. But uh, I would still say that those two technologies are more comprehensive to each other than like trying to compete with each other. Um, 5G is quite a new concept. It's still under the standardization between uh, different uh, different parts and standardized by different um, committees, like 3GPP. Uh, the more the virtualization part is uh, by ESDI. So I would say that uh, no, it probably will not uh, replace the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi will still be used for the um, like um, having private networks. Um, there is also a concept of the private network with the 5G, but the f probably they will be first deployed for the enterprises than for um, like home networks. So I would still say that. Uh, within the next couple of years and the 5G will be more for like the public and uh, enterprises and the Wi-Fi still will be used uh, more for the small, smaller deployments uh, and also with all of the devices we have right now which are which have only like the Wi-Fi connection um, even if the, the shift will happen because of some regulations or the general movement it will stay take a few years so I think there is no worry about like killing the Wi-Fi standard anytime soon also recently I think there was a new specification version 6 for the Wi-Fi which also have a quite few improvements so I think like the short answer will be no but we don't know the future so we'll see what it will bring in a few years okay how CNI supports integration with uh, hardware uh, so, when you have a multi uh, tool, you may use uh, it to connect uh, CNIs, but you may as well use it for SRIOV solutions or LPGA solutions, which are working with the hardware to, to provide networking in uh, Kubernetes. So, everything uh, may be done with the multis. Okay, for the 5G networks, like sync use case. Which one is better, the VRNF or the CNF? Um, so we see that the, the shift is more to the um, CNFs, and uh, together with the like uh, possibility to to have the diff the multiple interfaces for the CNFs, uh, they mostly would be used for the um, for the network slicing use cases. Um, and uh, the general uh, mm, like difference between the PNFs and the CNFs is that CNFs are more lightweight and we will be able to we will be able to bring them faster and also if we will be able to decouple uh, the multiple functions that were in the uh, VNFs to the CNFs, then we will be also able to scale a particular part of the network or the services more granularly. Uh, so I would say that. Uh, the VNFs probably uh, is better, but it depends on the use case. Uh, but the, the shift, like the, the whole part, is more to the CNFs um, part or the CNFs components. Uh, what is the difference between access and network and core uh, network? Uh, so. Uh, uh, it's a wide uh, topic, so when we think about the, the core network, that this is what provides the, the basic services and, uh, and spreads the, the infrastructure that provides the services that we have uh, in our infrastructure. Uh, while access network uh, is usually used to access the services, maybe from outside, maybe from uh, some other uh, sub sub network or sub infrastructure, so uh, it's more and more uh, secured uh, to do core network. Uh, and sometimes there's uh, like DMZs, so demilitarized zones in networking, uh, where you have uh, a separation between. Uh, the network that you may access and uh, services that you may access and the core network that 
uh, should not be accessed by someone from the external or uh, only by the trusted services. I think also when it comes to like the, the 5G part for the um, access and the core networks, there was like the, the, the well, a well known concept for the previous generation, like the core was the backbone of the network and the access was the last, like the um, simplifying the last mile problem, the last mile problem to connect to the, to the given users. Um, but uh, uh, together with the, um, with the uh, 5G, we mostly when we're talking about the access networks, we are talking about the radio access network. And this is like specified by the free GPP um, organization uh, in the details, but it's mostly the network that connects the, the mobile devices um, to the network. And the core part is just for connecting different elements and uh, different elements of the network and multiple of the access networks. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. How different is integration of Kubernetes and OpenShift? Okay, the, that's an interesting question because I worked a lot of that, that actually. And uh, you may think that Kubernetes and OpenShift uh, is pretty much the same. OpenShift has enter is enterprise uh, solution uh, of the Kubernetes, but in fact, OpenShift has uh, built uh, from from the ground all the components of the Kubernetes or a Kubernetes-like uh, system, which is an you know, OpenShift. So at the first sight, you may think that uh, OpenShift works in the same way as the Kubernetes. But when you take a deep dive into that, you, you'll see that uh, some configurations, some uh, some, for example, some configuration map, some services uh, work differently than uh, the Kubernetes. And sometimes when you have a really advanced uh, uh, service, which you want to integrate uh, containers, uh, you may have a problem to just take it from the Kubernetes and apply it to OpenShift uh, because of these nuances uh, in these both uh, solutions, both products. Okay, what can be some security related challenges with the 5G, so VNF or CNF deployment? Mm. So when it comes with, uh, to the security, um, there's a what, like, question what is more secure running the VM or running the container. And from that perspective, like running the, the VM is uh, more secure because you have the, like, the whole separated system uh, with, for example, a Linux separated kernel and then like the OS part. With the CNF part, you, this is something that is shared between the different containers. Um, so um, CNF deployments have, uh, there's some kind of trade-off, the, the lightweight infrastructure, but the more resources are shared between the containers. Um, so there are some challenges uh, regarding the potential uh, breakout of the given container and uh, uh, like affecting the, the other running functions. But also there are challenges for the, like, uh, yeah, for the incoming traffic and how to really monitor uh, the traffic between the containers, enforcing the policies. Uh, also making sure that the, uh, like the ingress rules are set up correctly. So I would say that there are still, still uh, challenges that uh, are not solved for the CNF deployments uh, and will probably require more uh, work in the tools to do it. Um, but there are already some projects that uh, trying to tackle those problems. Uh, for example, one of the projects which is called like the Kata containers where they're trying to provide uh, more secure uh, containers deployments. Uh, so there are some solutions that are trying to tackle this. Okay, so it seems that uh, there are no other questions. So I think that uh, we may finish here. So thank you for joining us uh, for this webinar. Uh, I hope so that you learned something, that uh, we created some curiosity in you for, for the 5G solutions uh, of the future. And maybe yeah. something for your side. 
And yeah, thank you for last the time. Word. <laughs> thank you, Shimon. Okay. And uh, see you in the future. Okay, thank you.